choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Most people don't get to witness the famous men, women, and occurrences of their times. In the 20th century, we rely on film and television to accurately reproduce events. The people in the 18th and early 19th centuries, not having the advantage of the camera, relied upon the artist's view of history. Art in colonial America and the early period of American history served two purposes. One, to beautify. It's a role that artists usually play. The other was different. It was to depict objects, people, and events. Originally, art in America, in colonial America, was almost exclusively portrait painting. That's what it had been in England. That's what it was in the colonies. It was said that wherever the English went, they took trial by jury, horse racing, and portrait painting. Portraiture was the only way that artists, what few there were in the colonies, could survive. Was it not for preserving the likeness of a person, painting would not have been known in colonial America. Why was art limited in colonial America? Why were artists involved almost exclusively in portrait painting? Well, for one thing, they were concerned with other matters, such as day-by-day -day survival. The plowman that raiseth grain is more serviceable to mankind than the painter. Other things had to be done. There was a new country to start. John Adams said that art would come later. I must study politics and war so my sons can learn math and philosophy and their sons painting and music. I would not give a sixpence for a painting by Raphael or a bust by Phidias. Others maintained that art could not survive in the cruel air of America. John Trumbull's father was always reminding him that Connecticut was not Athens. Then there was the matter of who would pay for the art. In Europe, many artists had patrons, wealthy people who would support them while they painted. Painted pictures of the wealthy family members. Or did work for the church, decorated the cathedral, or for royalty. But in the colonies, there was no royalty. As far as the church is concerned, well, the Puritans and the Quakers didn't believe in decorating their churches. It was too much like the Catholic or the Anglican church. And at best, art was a sinful waste of time. So the colonial artists had no financial support, no art schools, no museums, no one to sell his work to, except perhaps one type of work, portrait painting. People wanted their pictures, just like we want snapshots they wanted portraits of themselves and their family members. Some portrait painters became famous. Charles Wilson Peale, for example. He also had a museum in Independence Hall of art and science, displaying, among other things, Franklin's stuffed cat. Peale is an example of a portrait painter who painted historical events. That is, his interpretation of them. He painted a picture of the zooming of the first mastodon. Included people who were already dead, but who would have liked to have been there. Peel and his sons painted over 60 portraits of George Washington. Washington actually sat for 14 of them. If Washington came back to life today, he had better look like his picture on the $1 bill, or he might not even be recognized. That picture was from a portrait by Gilbert Stuart. Gilbert Stuart is probably the best known portrait painter in American history because of his paintings of George Washington. When he needed money, he would turn one out. Could do it in two hours. He used to sell them for $100, called them his $100 bills. Stuart was a big, sloppy, red-nosed, snuff-taking, spendthrift Rhode Islander. But he had a touch for doing portraits. Some said he couldn't paint anything else, that he couldn't paint anyone below the fifth button. He painted this skater just to prove them wrong. 
His painting of John Adams shows his skill. This is Adams at age 90. He has the watery eyes of an old man, the mouth of a man with no teeth. Nevertheless, look at the toughness that Stuart captured. It shows that that flinty old New Englander had been someone to contend with. Not just the wealthy wanted portraits or the famous. People of all classes wanted them. Portrait painters began to turn up everywhere. In fact, one person said, kick a dog kennel and a portrait painter will hop out. Some painters were much better than others. Mrs. Smith with her grandson is considered to be a good painting. She looks like a kindly grandmother, but that kid's not going to get away with very much. The artist reveals a certain firmness in the grandmother's character. Some painters were almost totally untrained. Many of them are referred to as folk painters. They would uh, oftentimes derive some of the elements in their paintings from copying prints of traditional academic artists, but they would adapt them to a very linear, flat, almost diagrammatic style. One of the problems of portrait painting was who's going to buy your work after it's finished. In this case, the woman in the picture probably would. Maybe her family would be interested, but who else? Unless this picture is a real masterpiece, or unless she's a particularly famous woman, who else wants it? See, someone like George Washington would be different. Many Americans seem to feel it was their patriotic duty to have Washington's picture hanging in their home. But how about your portrait? Who wants it? Well, artists realized that. They knew if they were going to have a wide market for their works, they had to paint on other topics. And after the American Revolution, they began to do that. Noah Webster said that if America is independent in politics, it ought to be independent in art. Artists should depict American subjects, not European. They should depict subjects that were designed to inspire national pride. There were paintings of the Continental Congress debating the Declaration of Independence, of John Paul Jones's famous ship, the Bonhomme Richard, defeating the British ship Serapis, of Adams and Franklin and John Jay at the peace conference that ended the Revolutionary War. Washington saying farewell to his officers. These were events that inspired Americans. They depicted their past. Maybe not accurately. Remember, these were painted after the fact. Their artists' interpretations. Take this one. Washington crossing the Delaware. One of the best known paintings in all American art history. But there's things wrong with it. The boat is too small. Washington would not have stood up in a boat that small. But what's the artist going to do? Are you going to have your hero crouching in the prow of a boat? Doesn't he look better standing up? It was daylight in the painting. Actually, the crossing was made at night. But a dark painting, you couldn't see anything. It shows the American flag. There was no American flag at the time. It's an example of the artist adding his interpretation to a historical event. And the point here is, the painting began to switch to American topics. One-eyed, cranky old John Trumbull, who had served in the Revolutionary War and painted pictures of it, said that painting was frivolous unless it depicted historic subjects. It's little useful to society and unworthy of a man who has talents for more serious pursuits, but worthwhile if it preserves the memories of noble action. Many artists felt that their work should teach a lesson. Edward Hicks, the Pennsylvania Quaker, painted over 100 pictures entitled The Peaceable Kingdom. They're full of animals lying around together, small children patting leopards and their arms around lions. He had read the verse in the Bible that said, the lion will lie down with the lamb. And to him, that applied to America. America was to be a peaceable kingdom, a haven in which all races, all nationalities, lived happily together. What other American topics were there? Well, there were new books being written about America. Artists depicted scenes from Washington Irving's works. For example, The Return of Rip Van Winkle or The Headless Horseman. <laughs> then there was the American landscape. 
Go forth under the open sky and listen to nature's teachings. And that's exactly what artists did. They painted the unspoiled American countryside. Since many of them lived along the Hudson River Valley in New York, their style of painting became known as the Hudson River School. And the best known member of that school was probably Thomas Cole. This is one of his works. It may have a European building in it. That doesn't make any difference. It's the American landscape, romanticized perhaps. The people are insignificant. It's the landscape that counts. Other painters left the Hudson River Valley and went to western New York. And there they painted Niagara Falls, and Niagara Falls, and Niagara Falls. If nature is significant, how about man in a state of nature? How about the American Indians? Shouldn't they be painted? Earlier, the Indian had been shown, but usually in the form of an enemy. But one artist, George Catlin, saw Indians differently. Catlin spent eight years in the West, capturing what he called the silent dignity of the lords of the forest. Should painting just be of heroic subjects? Or should it be of the common man? Andrew Jackson was elected president, you remember, in 1828. He was a champion of the common man. Shouldn't artists be concerned with the common man? Paint pictures that will take the public. Never paint for the few, but for the many. What developed was called genre painting. Everyday human activity. Democracy in action. The stump speaker campaigning for office. The long story. Two men around a pot-bellied stove, one listening as the other drones on. Portraits such as this of the average person. This is obviously a frontiersman, a common man who has been successful, and he is at last taking his ease with his pipe on his own front porch. In 1839, the camera was invented. And that began to change things. Before the camera, artists had always played the role of depicting historical events more or less realistically. Now they're freed from that. They can afford to become unrealistic if they want to. The camera never really replaced artists, but it did for most famous events and people. When you think of Abraham Lincoln, do you think of this portrait or do you think of this photograph by Matthew Brady? Which does a better job? Robert E. Lee after the surrender of the South. Which captures his spirit better? This photograph or this painting? American artists started out painting portraits and they have continued to do so. But American life changed and American art changed along with it. Artists switched to depicting American topics, to painting the American landscape, to commemorating events that Americans thought were important. Art reflects the political and social values of its time. And as such, it provides valuable insight into American life. 